Bonjour et bienvenue à cette série de cafés virtuels de l'École de la fonction publique. Uh, my name is uh, Michel Doré and I will be your moderator today. Um, this is a series aims to introduce um, uh, to the public service some very distinguished speakers, both from inside and outside the public service. And today uh, we have the pleasure of talking about, uh, oh, a very small topic called Europe today. And I was going to say the UK and Europe today, because we're now dealing with a different uh, configuration. Um, alors, il me fait plaisir aussi de vous indiquer que le, la séance est disponible en interprétation simultanée et je pourrais aussi uh, vous engager nos, nos deux panélistes uh, dans les deux langues officielles. And so we have the pleasure uh, today of having uh, two uh, wonderful speakers, um, Eilish Campbell, who is our ambassador to the European Union, and Stephanie Beck, who is the Deputy High Commissioner uh, to the uh, uh, United Kingdom. And um, the topic today is, is kind of an interesting one because uh, all countries are coming out of the pandemic. Um, the European Union is coming out of the Brexit <laughs> environment on top of the pandemic. Um, the UK is as well. Et uh, on fait tous face à uh, des développements intéressants avec l'administration Biden. Alors, comment composer avec la nouvelle relation avec les États-Unis? Uh, on a un joueur important qui se manifeste de plus en plus, qui est la Chine. Et en Europe, on a, ben, partout aussi dans le monde, on a la Russie, uh, qui est toujours un peu uh, un joueur uh, intéressant. Um, and finally, the big uh, player in all of this is climate change. So while we have pandemic, we have uh, the US, we have China, Russia, but the climate change issue is also prevalent. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, understanding a bit about Europe when I was the ambassador and permanent representative of Canada to the OECD, the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation and Development. And um, I, thought, I saw there the dynamic of the bloc of the European Union, as well as how the individual countries were able to manifest themselves. And there are always a few inherent tensions within the European bloc, but there are also some um, really important elements for Canada. It is um, a group of uh, countries of 440 million. Uh, the UK is close to 70 million. Um, the Union is our uh, second largest trading partner. Um, and within that, the UK was our biggest trading partner. So I'm now going to turn to our two uh, presenters today to give uh, a bit of background on themselves and what, what they're up to and how they see Europe today, a small topic, and the UK today. So um, Eilish, over to you. Merci, Michel. Je suis tellement content d'être parmi vous aujourd'hui et un, un grand bonjour à, à tous, uh, tous l'équipe uh, à Ottawa et uh, autour du Canada. I thought I would begin with just a, a short introduction, perhaps uh, to the EU and five key points, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. The EU is composed, as Michel was describing, uh, of a good number of now continental member states since the recent just completed exit of the UK, uh, which... Uh, Deputy High Commissioner Beck will discuss. It's 27 members. It's a group of countries that first began around a nucleus of coal and steel community in the 1950s. It's extended over time to include a common agricultural policy, a common group position on trade, and now a more increasingly layered relationship that for some of the 27 members includes a common currency, certainly the existence of the single market that we've discussed, as well as collaboration on a whole host of issues including science and technology, data, and I think also, as Michelle's really importantly pointed out, on environment. Some of the things that the EU 27 members, which now extend, imagine, all the way from Portugal and Spain, we've got Italy and Greece in the south, all the way, of course, to Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, uh, Sweden, and the Nordics, uh, with the exception of, of course, Norway is not in the EU is perhaps the easier way to describe it. Switzerland is not in the EU. Things that are still held at the member state level include, very importantly for Canada, related to border policy. There's an internal common 
uh, understanding that citizens can move freely inside the Schengen uh, parts of the European Union. But of course, member states retain policies over border, over immigration, and over key aspects of healthcare. And that's obviously been a live issue this year during the pandemic. The five areas quickly I want to touch upon, first of all, are common values and common importance of the rule of law domestically and our shared emphasis on democratic institutions, both internally and shoring those up, defending, you know, not just promoting democracy, but defending democracy from disinformation. Don't forget it's a complex neighborhood here, bordering, of course, uh, with, with Russia, who has had active, as, as is publicly known, active disinformation against vaccines, including uh, those that have been approved by the European Medical uh, Agency. Um, and of course, uh, our NATO relationship, incredibly important. The second piece I want to talk about, security. So the EU is an increasing partner on its own independent defense policy. But at the same time, Canada is a full member, and it's my colleague, Ambassador David Angel, who's our ambassador to NATO. Thirdly, the environment, which on climate change, climate action, as we lead to both COP15 on biodiversity and COP26 on climate change, Canada is incredibly active with and has a unique relationship with the EU. We both have a price on carbon. We're both actively looking at carbon border adjustment measures. We're both trying to increase climate ambition around the world, and we have a ministerial collaboration between ourselves, China, and the EU, which was occurring, I, I think, at a difficult time, I think, during our relationship on the environment when the US left the Paris Agreement, that ambition globally be built with uh, our European partners. And we can talk more about that. I think also related, of course, is our work in the Arctic, where we shouldn't forget we share the Arctic Circle, of course, with many EU member states, including, of course, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland very active in the Arctic Council. Fourth, trade, where we have a trade and cooperation partnership, the CETA agreement. And uh, there, I have to say, Michelle, the, the proof is in the pudding, three and a half years into this agreement now ratified. Trade has increased more than 25% on both sides between 2016 and, and 2019, and during an incredibly difficult year in the pandemic. We saw our Canadian exports to the EU, in fact, state almost perfectly stable, with some increases, particularly as Canada demonstrated its value proposition as a food security partner globally to Latin and South America, Asia, and of course to the EU during the pandemic, amongst other products, not least of which uh, included inputs uh, and various contributions to vaccines. We received, of course, uh, a, a large amount uh, of our Q1 vaccines from the European Union, that included our Pfizer supply chain and our Moderna supply chain. So the EU, if the you know again, I like proof points, I like data. No better, I think, um, data point could be found in terms of the closeness of this relationship than the continued exports of vaccines to Canada. Um, and finally, of course, just want to touch on innovation and technology because it's a question of how we're coming out of the pandemic and investments on research and development, innovation, and scaling up our companies is important. We have incredible. EU investors in Canadian companies scaling up and vice versa. Very strong FDI uh, on the technology side in Europe, strong business to business sales. And of course, continued collaboration on biotech, artificial intelligence, and a whole range of digital applications that are going to be essential to how we live life after this pandemic. So I've just touched on a few points, Michelle. I hope that's a helpful introduction. Looking forward to our discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Eilish, that covers quite a lot. Stephanie, over to you. Yeah. Well, similarly, it's difficult to squeeze everything into a few minutes, mais je vais essayer de comme mettre la table, just pour commencer. And of course, happy to take questions in both official languages uh, afterwards. Um, it is a very timely discussion, of course. Uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, lands in Cornwall on June 10th on Thursday today, and uh, he has his very first G7 summit meeting, I think the first in two years. So the Brits are very excited about this and determined since the beginning to have an in-person summit. This was extremely important to them and very meaningful in, in many, many different ways, which we can walk through a bit later. Um, I wanted to start though, right at the beginning though, why Brexit? 
why leave? Uh, I think it's fair to say that from an economics perspective, not a good idea. I don't think there were a whole lot of economists out there saying, hey, we should really remove ourselves from the European Union. This has not been a good deal for us. Not at all. This is very much a political discussion, an emotional discussion, um, one that is heard and interpreted differently across all the four nations. People tend to forget that the United Kingdom is made up of four nations, and each of them had a very different perspective on Brexit and indeed now going forward on the implementation. Um, devolution itself, unlike in Canada, where our federal provincial territorial structure has been in place since the beginning, uh, here it's only just over 20 years old, and that shows, and I think those kinds of issues have become exacerbated with Brexit. So the impact of COVID, the pandemic over the last 18 months has to some extent hidden the impact of Brexit on the economy of the United Kingdom and indeed a little bit on the European Union as well. It's a little hard to judge what the statistics are due only to the pandemic and due as well to Brexit itself. The very long transition period created massive uncertainty for, well, all the players really, not just the European Union remaining members, but the United Kingdom and all of the trading partners as well. Canada acted early to put in place a continuity agreement, basically a transition agreement from our brilliant CETA, the Canada-Europe Trade Agreement, to something more substantive, which will be negotiated uh, starting probably in September, the fall of this year. Um, the negotiations themselves, I would say, through four years of uncertainty, three prime ministers, two elections in the United Kingdom, meant there was a lot of bitterness and this was not a win-win situation. You know, in most negotiations, we look for where do we have common ground? Where do we want a similar outcome? In this one, each side had different reasons for wanting to show success that would actually be to the detriment of the other side. The United Kingdom needed to show we are better out than in. The European Union needed to show that, well, actually, it's hard to get out, it's not worth leaving, and you're better off staying in. So having that diametrically opposed kind of conversation is partly why it took four years, but also why it got so bitter and nasty at the end. Uh, sitting here in London, you could tell it was very much a domestic political issue. And not only was the prime minister negotiating for a strong outcome for the country, he needed also to make sure that each of the nations was able to get, some, get something out of it. Of course, uh, the recent elections in Scotland have shown that the Scottish National Party is back again and with a, a significant numbers. And their goal is to return to the European Union and to get out of the United Kingdom. Of course, no prime minister of the United Kingdom wants to preside over that kind of change that would be coming. So we can go more deeply into the different nations going forward, but very interesting. I think where the UK has really been able to leverage the return of authorities home is around foreign policy. Um, you will have seen it, of course, I'm sure you've all read their new integrated review, uh, a long complicated document, but really the intent is to show that we're back on our own, we have our foreign policy independence, we can make decisions quickly, we are agile, we know where we're going, and we can pivot or tilt to the Indo-Pacific if that's what we feel like doing. We can work more closely with the Five Eyes if that's what we feel like doing. So these kinds of changes having the UK outside of the European Union are actually very good for Canada. We're finding a, a new, stronger partner with whom we can work very successfully on a whole range of foreign policy issues. And that's made a big difference to us. Um, be, I'd be interested to hear from the other side, the European Union without the UK, right? It has had an influence within, even if it's only one country, but it has had an influence. And, and that has also the shifted the balance of power within the union itself. The other thing that has come back to the United Kingdom, what I referred to at the beginning, it makes it harder for them, are things like devolved authorities. So the United Kingdom has not had to come up with any agricultural policy, for instance, in 40 years. So how do you do it? Who makes up the rules? Who decides where the money that is not going to the European Union is going? What's the framework around each of those? How much goes to the nations? How much do they keep here in London? All of those kinds of questions, 
clearly were not thought through in great detail, even through those four years. And now that the chickens are coming home to roost, as the expression goes, there's been a lot of scurrying around going, oh, wait, but we also need people to administer this and we need expertise and we're not quite sure where to start. So there's been a lot of that kind of discussion in the background over the last few months. Oh, and I haven't even started on the Northern Ireland protocol, but we can save that for later. I'll stop there. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, you both led, led, um, pointed to the changes a bit in foreign policy um, and how that would relate to Canada. Uh, the European Union has uh, emerged with a, I guess its own now foreign affairs group after some discussions. And um, how does that relate to Canada and how do we relate now to the European Union in that context? And the same thing for the UK. Uh, how are we positioning ourselves? The UK did a bit of a, I was going to say pivot, but it's a bit more than that in relation to China. For a long time, it was very uh, open and friendly to China. And all, it did, a, I would say, 180. That's a bit more than a pivot. Um, and uh, so, and I'll use China as an example, perhaps, for the European Union, which is a bit, I, my view, struggling a bit on that um, on that issue, on the positioning on that. So how does Canada navigate the new foreign policy environment of the EU and, um, and the UK? So uh, Stephanie, I'll start with you and then I'll turn to Eilish. And I think the, the, the phrase that comes up right away is the transatlantic relationship. Right? And this is something uh, Dr. Campbell and, and we here and others, in fact, at all of our missions across the European capitals have been coming to terms with. The change with the administration in the United States has also opened up lots of opportunities, not just for us, not the UK, the EU, but everybody. And I think there's a fair bit of review and rumination on how we can best position ourselves to take advantage of that. We have a window of opportunity right now. Um, strictly Canada-UK bilateral relationship on the foreign policy side and with relation to China. Um, I think if anything is becoming clear, it's the extent of collaboration that exists between our countries. Uh, not a day goes by that we are not in the foreign office here or vice versa, them reaching out to us asking for views on any number of countries. China is absolutely one of those uh, about which we discuss regularly. Uh, the UK has been extremely supportive and helpful to us in our quest to get our two Canadian citizens, the Michaels, out of the arbitrary detention in which they have been for too long now. Um, the UK has always been at the front of the line uh, being helpful in that. Um, I'd say it goes broader than that though too, because uh, people need to remember we have, I believe it's over 300,000 Canadian citizens living in Hong Kong. If anything happens there where people start to feel the need to leave, it very much affects us too. Hong Kong therefore another, uh, not an issue, it's a, a burning deep messy file with multiple aspects to it where we regularly discuss with the UK what their plans are, what their public announcements are going to be and how to move forward. On the other hand, there's always the, the more prosaic discussions around trade and the need to engage and what happens with uh, uh, trying to demonstrate solidarity in corporate social responsibility in businesses doing business with parts of the Chinese society and agencies that are reliable and are, for instance, not um, using employees in ways that they shouldn't be doing so. So it's a, a, a complex and profound relationship. And I think now is a, is a really good opportunity since the UK is finding it is more fleet of foot and we can take advantage of that agility. Ava? Yeah, I, I think I can build really well on what Stephanie was saying, because I think, you know, what she was talking about in terms of agility on the UK side uh, is a really powerful point. And I think in talking about Canada and the European Union on foreign policy, um, again, I would start with uh, a foundation around NATO and, and our security relationship. I, I'm not sure how many Canadians appreciate that one of our largest 
if not the largest uh, battalion of Canadians is right now in the European Union in Latvia, uh, conducting operations and of course, uh, assuring uh, the Latvian border and uh, watching for foreign interference. So that um, operation is incredibly important and is one of the strongest areas of collaboration. And it's happening, as I say, through this uh, structural foundation of our relationship, which bridges the UK, the US, and the EU nicely. Stephanie said the transatlantic relationship, exactly. Uh, I think I'd layer on top of that, and I think this is a really interesting structural piece, uh, is the fact that unlike in trade policy or, for example, in aspects of economic policy, and by the way, I apologize, my lights are going on, on and off, and I all I can say is, hey, in the pandemic, it's just a miracle that I'm even online. So I'm focusing on the big picture here. Um, but it, Foreign policy is done by unanimity. Foreign policy is done by unanimity here. What does that mean? It means that often the EU cannot create a common position. One member state has to veto or one member state has to present um, a, a refusal um, uh, or absent themselves. And, and that ability of the EU to project themselves in foreign policy uh, falls down. So that is a real challenge and an incredibly active. I, I think what's fascinating in the European Union for Canada and the lessons are, are across a whole range of areas is around governance, Michelle um, and, and Stephanie, right? It's, it's around what structures are our allies choosing in order to make really complex decisions and trade-offs. And in foreign policy, the active discussion here is whether there should be uh, a common uh, perspective on uh, introducing what's called majority voting, essentially, to come up with a, with a common foreign policy. That, that to date has not been accepted by member states. And then I think what we can talk about is volatility and values. So the world is becoming more volatile, even closer to home. And that, that includes, of course, the US, which, for example, has not had uh, a stable policy on issues like uh, immigration and, uh, for example, uh, closer to home for us as well, the environment. And so what that means is Canada has to be even more assertive about its, about its values and interests and it has to build coalitions of partners. It's a much more complicated world, I think, than the one uh, I first joined Global Affairs Canada back in the, the trade department 15 years ago. And that complexity means that we are analyzing issue by issue where our coalitions of partners uh, exist. And we, we could get into some of those, and that includes, of course, on human rights, on sanctions, and the importance uh, that Stephanie talked about of transparent supply chains across a whole range of products some supply chains incredibly complex uh, and some supply chains for Canada quite simple, including uh, commodity agricultural products uh, that we're going to continue to export at scale around the world. So we need to really start parsing out what we do in terms of foreign policy, in terms of trade, in terms of security on those uh, multilateral partners on an on a, on a issue by issue basis. While we work, and I think this is, again, in addition to, to NATO on the institutional side, there's certain multilateral institutions, including during the pandemic, the World Health Organization uh, on the trade side, the World Trade Organization, where the rules-based international order and our prosecution of, of our partners, again, remains you know, global in scale, and we have to move forward together. Uh, climate change, of course, the, the third example that I might table there. I think those are... Um really interesting points because uh, when I was sitting at the OECD, I could see where there were divergences of values even within the European members of the OECD, but there were convergences on some very important topics even for Canada, such as the digital economy. So while I sometimes had, um, I was leading a group on, on gender equity plus or gender equality plus, and I even had a a few challenges of getting a number of our interesting European colleagues to sit at the table. But there was a group on the digital economy and everybody came. So you could see where the interest lies, both on the privacy, on the technology, on the artificial intelligence, on quantum. Everyone wanted to participate because the rules in this area have yet to be completely set. Um, the other uh, aspect was on climate change. Even if there were some differences of opinion or views, everyone saw the impact, and I would say post-pandemic, even more so. So perhaps you could talk a bit about how the UK is positioning and Canada can position itself on 
um, areas of common interest, so climate, technology, and I would throw in post-pandemic building back. Uh, there's some really interesting opportunities. So Ailish, you touched on a couple of those. Over to you. Sure. I think the most important thing that we can do is, is first of all, check our assumptions. Um, Michelle, you know, what are we, what are we building back from and what might have structurally changed, uh, particularly over the last year? And I say that because I think what we're going to see is we see some green shoots on the labor market side in Canada, right? Um, employment edging up, um, hours worked is obviously a, a real measure of, of our economic success. But I'd also say on economic inclusion, uh, this has been, uh, in the words of, of some experts, uh, a she session where women have left the labor market. And if we don't solve childcare, we, we don't solve economic inclusion and a recovery. And the reason I say that is because we've got to check our assumptions about how we partnered with countries over the last year. Uh, what, were the, what were the positives? What were the challenges? Obviously on vaccine diplomacy, Canada and the European Union, along with partners like the US, have financed at the global level COVAX, the COVAX facility and the ACT uh, Accelerator, which are about a pandemic recovery for the world. And you know, we're gonna solve, first of all, distribution and access to vaccines in Canada. I take note and I'm thrilled that the North and Indigenous communities were prioritized for the vaccine rollout in Canada and that in their own languages, we had a lot of public health innovation, um, including community-based public health. We've got a lot to share with the European Union on that. And we have a lot to share, I think, on both the challenges and successes around digital health. That will be a live issue right now as we build out interoperability on recognizing each other's vaccine certificates. And you know, Stephanie knows better than anyone, this is a, a, a huge amount of work by our colleagues around the world. But um, Michelle, you got at something I think really fundamental. So I'll just pick one thing and that's data. Data is generated all the time, everywhere. The European Union, and I think this is you know, stylistically really interesting for uh, the, the public servants and, and people that are joining us today. I can't emphasize enough the emphasis on privacy and on permissions here. It's a very, pro-consumer activist uh, version um, of data generation, data storage, the right to be forgotten. The EU has been at the forefront globally, frankly, on a, on a range of these issues. Canada with its interoperability with both the European Union, with the UK now, with the US, and I think increasingly, obviously, uh, with the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership with partners like Australia, Japan, and New Zealand, Vietnam and others, we're trying to create a system where we have those kinds of permissions and transparency on data. We have data localization, for example, on sensitive information like health. And then we're also allowing uh, more open data prosecution than perhaps our European partners when it comes to what is uh, consumer related data. I, don't, I, I think we're exactly, as you said, uh, Michelle, we're still in a building process here so many questions and regulations yet to both be built, be reformed, be adapted. A huge discussion right now on platform technologies. And my message is in fact to our US cousins where I think they have in fact to catch up to us uh, because I think it's clear that we're building uh, the next economic fundamentals and new business models, which are obviously already in place including with Google and Amazon and on the Canadian side with champions uh, like Shopify and MindBridge, um, our financial institutions. And we have not yet come to a common understanding, frankly, amongst democracies in those issues. It's why your work at the OECD was so important and a file to watch this year. But, you know, frankly, for the next five to 10 years, because these things are complicated and never get solved, is rules on taxation of digital products, data generated products, which, you know, Michelle, you were at the heart of this at the OECD. Those issues are not only not solved, the US just before arriving here for their summit, the US EU summit has announced a, a countermeasure against those countries who have introduced a digital tax, which includes France, Spain, and the United Kingdom. They've suspended it pending talks for six months, but these are the kind of areas where Canada has to be incredibly clear about the ability to tax 
productive businesses, no matter what their business model is, to have the fiscal revenue to come in to address not only the incredible fiscal measures that were taken during the pandemic, but also set up, I think, uh, a more equal tax uh, and sustainable fiscal model for ourselves. And also that by its nature, it involves our partners in Europe, the UK and the US. And I think we'll see uh, even more of a US presence on those fronts as we've seen with uh, Janet Yellen and her proposal on a, a, I'll call it a flat corporate tax, probably not how she would qualify it. Um, and minimum. the, and the, sorry, minimum, the minimum, minimum yes. <laughs> and um, uh, the uh, Biden administration coming forward with its, uh, its proposal to reach an agreement with the EU on privacy. And uh, that is also going to be, and we have a, a Canada EU summit coming up, and I'll come to that in, in, a, in a minute, but we have a, um, a Stephanie, I'll, I'll turn to you to, to touch on a couple of the subject areas that uh, we've just been talking about. Yeah, well, and they're all massive, right? And we could, we could just talk digital taxation for half an hour anyway. And, and those discussions were held at the G7 finance ministers meeting in London recently. And there will have been lots of pronouncements from DPM Freeland. So very interesting to watch something that actually has been discussed in, I don't know, in cabinet for many, many years now, how to make the most of what we have, how to secure that revenue and how to best direct it. Right? What do we actually do with it when it comes in? There, I mean, a whole lot of other discussions around that going forward. Um, on uh, the, the climate change, I would always say climate change and biodiversity, right? Adding in the nature aspect to that as well. Crucial for a country like Canada. It, it tends to be an afterthought, and yet it's actually underlying the development of our country in every single way, right? We can't not talk about nature. Um, it's, it's the heartbeat of our own uh, nation and our, our own dependence and interdependence on other countries as well. Um, the UK has the uh, pride and joy of hosting the G7 this year, but also COP26. And they have made those two summits the crown jewels in their new foreign policy, but also domestic policy. Uh, since January and even before with relation to the G7, the UK government has made it very clear that they have very high ambitions. They have put out a lot of uh, uh, weight and phone calls and diplomatic demarches around the planet, aiming at the countries who really need to step up now. And, and as many will know already, the pandemic will pass, climate change will not. Uh, an enduring problem that we need to deal with. It is no less urgent than the pandemic. And this is something that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has never ceased to state. So you will see a progression in the kinds of activities they've undertaken and the announcements. And uh, we expect to hear more, of course, out of the G7 summit once that's all said and done. But there's going to be another summit held at the end of July here in London, summit at the ministerial level to again push countries to come forward. They're hoping for a net zero G7 for more announcements on carbon, but also how do you get international business more involved, owning it more, responding to clients and consumers more. So you've seen Mark Carney taking action on that and you know, he's almost half a Brit having spent so much time here and his wife being a Brit as well, but now working for the United Nations on something we can all agree on. And I think you'll see more businesses stepping up. A couple of the Canadian pension funds have already said that they will be moving to net zero. We'll be seeing more of that as we go forward. Uh, oil and gas in Canada looking to how they can transform their energy production into something cleaner. Canadian government can, of course, help with that. But but it's not something we're going to do alone. And this is one of the goals of the United Kingdom is really to bring everybody on board as we go forward and, and have some even better announcements in time for COP26 in Glasgow, November 1, 2, right at the beginning. Not clear uh, if it'll be the usual 30,000 people, by the way. Uh, it may well, well, you know, pandemic oblige. Uh, may just be leaders and key negotiators and the rest of uh, the normal contingent who would be there in a hybrid uh, setup, you know, having businesses on the side, something like that instead, or smaller groups. 
um, but something to look forward to there for sure. On, uh, on building back better, that's also a theme coming out of the G7 summit for sure, and the UK is, is the first to say it out loud. I think Canada has also morphed that into building back greener and better and more equitably. Uh, certainly those of you who are working on medium term transition planning, uh, those will be the kinds of programs and policies that Privy Council Office will be looking for going forward, something that manages to hit on multiple issues at once. Here in the UK, uh, they refer to that as leveling up. So trying to spread the wealth across the country, in particular the north of England, where coincidentally Boris Johnson needs more seats, not that it's related or anything like that, but obviously something that's important to ensure that <clears throat> the most vulnerable communities are the ones that are part of the, the recovery over the coming months and years. Euh, je, vais, je vais revenir un peu sur euh, une question que vous avez toutes les deux mentionnée. Euh, ce sont les femmes. Alors, euh, euh, le sommet du G7 a continué l'initiative canadienne euh, sur l'importance euh, de l'égalité. Euh, L'Union européenne euh, a des femmes très importantes euh, à la tête euh, de la Banque centrale, euh, la présidente. Euh, Quels sont les éléments sur lesquels, et, et là, je suis mentionné la, les questions de gouvernance aussi, les modèles de gouvernance. Alors, comment est-ce que le Canada et l'Union européenne peuvent travailler ensemble pour avancer euh, les questions d'équité en matière de genre, ou d'égalité, je devrais plutôt dire, en matière de genre? Et la même chose pour euh, le sommet du G7, on s'attend à quoi dans, à ce niveau-là? Michel, peut-être je, je pourrais ajouter trois points. Le premier, c'est que j'ai fait un petit peu de recherche ce matin et c'est tellement intéressant, selon moi, qu'au Canada, comme ambassadrice, nous avons une moitié, presque une moitié euh, de nos ambassadeurs, ambassadrices, sont des femmes. Mais surtout, c'est une question pour les économistes comme moi, c'est une question de distribution. Et je dois dire encore, euh, en plus, qu'il y a euh, une moitié des femmes Euh, dans les postes du G7. Et je pense que ça, c'est aussi important. C'est notre euh, ambassadeur à Washington, Kirsten Hillman, oui. Notre ambassadrice euh, euh, ici euh, en, en Europe, euh, en France, Isabelle Houdon. Et je pense que la représentation, c'est tellement, tellement important. Et je dis ça parce que seulement six de les 27 membres états de l'Union européenne ont une femme qui est le représentant ici à Bruxelles comme leur ambassadrice ou ambassadeur ici pour l'Union européenne. Pour moi, l'Union européenne a un défi, selon moi, sur seulement le, on dit, euh, le, le première étape, et ça, c'est la représentation. Okay? Deuxièmement, nous sommes totalement euh, alignés sur le féminisme, mais surtout avec euh, les, membres, les pays membres du Nord, comme euh, les Suédois, uh, et euh, Finlande. Aujourd'hui, j'ai parlé avec le représentant permanent uh, là, Maya, est, elle, elle est incroyable, une, une femme tellement puissante. Um, mais je dois dire que le féminisme n'est pas accepté au milieu de beaucoup de cultures, pas uh, dans la même façon qu'au Canada. Alors, nous avons une, une, beaucoup de discussions et surtout avec, uh, uh, pas seulement les gouvernements, mais aussi uh, uh, avec uh, le, le, les groupes de business où il n'y a pas les représentants de, 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 des femmes au niveau de, de chef, ça veut dire le, le suite C, on dit C suite, mais aussi euh, aux têtes euh, comme PDG, comme CEOs. Oui. Euh, troisièmement, je, je pourrais dire, et, et Michel, vous avez souligné notre collaboration, notre co coopération euh, dans le G7, au milieu du G7, et euh, ça c'est concernant le développement des femmes et des filles au développement. Ça veut dire au troisième pays, on pourrait dire en Afrique, et le développement, l'éducation euh, des filles, des petits, ça c'est tellement, tellement important. Et, je, et, et, et sur ce troisième euh, trajet, on pourrait dire, sur, sur ce troisième aspect, je suis plus confiant dans notre collaboration avec l'Union européenne. Stéphanie? Um, pour nous, je dirais que c'est la même chose ici au Royaume-Uni. Uh, uh, 
euh, une emphase euh, très importante sur qu'est-ce qui se passe côté euh, développement des femmes, euh, je dirais non seulement au niveau du G7, mais aussi lors des discussions de leur développement bilatéral et multilatéral. Euh, comme vous le savez, le Royaume-Uni a coupé de beaucoup euh, leurs dons pour cette année. Ils ont dit à cause de la pandémie, mais ça va revenir, espérons-le, dans les années qui viennent. Euh, mais ils ont quand même gardé comme priorité le retour à l'école, par exemple, pour les, les jeunes femmes et aussi euh, l'éducation en général. Mais pour le G7, plus spécifiquement, um, uh, education, of course, uh, female empowerment and ending violence against women. Ce sont les trois, trois thèmes, si vous voulez, mais ça commence à uh, des dès maintenant à la maison. En fait, le Royaume-Uni, ils sont en train de changer leur législation qui traite à la violence contre les femmes. Et il y a eu quelques événements dernièrement ici à Londres qui ont vraiment amené ça en haut dans tous les journaux et les médias. Um, something that is critical to the future of UK politics as well. So it, it's not an economic question. It's not a political question. It's everywhere all the time. How can we make sure the recovery includes women, includes vulnerable communities too, of course. They are often one and the same. Um, and the UK will also be hosting at the end of July uh, another big uh, international conference on girls' education and are seeking large financial contributions from many countries, including Canada. And this is actually also an outcome of G7 at Charlevoix, just like the Gender Equality Advisory Council was as well. And we were very happy to have Ambassador Isabelle Udon part of that council again before she goes off to be the head of the uh, BDC, Banque de Développement Canadien, si je ne me trompe. Um, can I take you both now on something that is um, uh, going to, it, it's a subject that is on many fronts, those who travel, is the, but also in Canada, the, the vaccine passport. Um, and how is the European Union addressing that and what impact might it have on Canada? And I know that it is a bit of an issue in the UK as well, <clears throat> not just in the UK transatlantic relationship, but also the UK EU relationship. So um, just um, it's a, a bit of a topical issue. Eilish, do you have any perspectives on that? Sure, uh, Michelle. And, and before we address that, I just want to build on what Stephanie was saying in that last piece. I think something that came out of the work in the G7 was also how much work Canada still has to do on diversity and inclusion. So, I, I mean, I just take note that representation is so much beyond gender, and, and we're going to keep working on that as well. Um, and uh, I think, you know, just even closer to home, representation of Canada requires us to do so much more work and we're going to do that hard work on better representing all of Canada, including from uh, racial backgrounds, uh, LGBTQ plus backgrounds, uh, really just becoming, I think, just much richer and more representative of us in all of our facets. And I, I take note, we're all women, we're all white women. Uh, you know, there's lots of work that we can do to lift up, uh, but also promote actively at our senior levels Uh, so many fantastic Canadians. So I, I, when I say this with some humility, because I can, I, I'll, be, I, I'll be frank, I can kind of, you know, uh, really uh, put the gears to the Europeans on gender representation, but we've got work to do at home on, on so many other vectors. Your question on vaccine passports, uh, listen, first thing I learned from our amazing consular team, don't say passport, I'm supposed to say vaccine certificate because there's only one passport and that's the one that you get in order to cross borders and that's invaluable, right? And I'm okay. looking at Stephanie. All right, thank you, okay. thank you for that. I will now say vaccine certificates. Okay. Hey, listen, I was in the same basket. I was in the same uh, group as you. So I, I, I'm, I'm repeating the fantastic advice of my consular people. Um, and in that respect, uh, we're going to see, I think three important factors. The first is which vaccines the World Health Organization. So this just uh, impresses upon us the, the importance of the bilateral cooperation, but also at a multilateral level. The World Health Organization is the one that's deciding, if you will, what threshold a vaccine has to be uh, efficacious 
in order to get onto one of their lists. Then member states are going to have to decide if they accept that WHO list or if they're going to create a subset of vaccines that they consider permissible to be you, uh, for example, or citizens abroad to be designated as vaccinated, right? Secondly, uh, I think this is going to uh, come into how we recognize certificates. Will there be a kind of global not-for-profit? Uh, there's a number of initiatives, including from the WHO. Uh, I would say the the uh, World Economic Forum is is working on something called Common Pass with a not-for-profit group. There could be others, Five I, uh, et cetera, where we understand which paperwork is going to be accepted or not. But we come back to a, an even more fundamental issue, and I think Stephanie touched upon it. You know, how do we live with COVID? And in that respect, new variants, uh, the requirement to get on airplanes has corporate policies. Airlines themselves are setting their own policies, for example, for negative testing. How sensitive those tests have to be if it's 24 hours before in some countries, if it's 72 hours before for others, there's a lot of questions to work through. And that's why our colleagues on the border working in public health are, are so important. I just huge kudos to all of those working on these issues. And there's not going to be one definitive answer. There's going to be multiple. And finally, inside the EU, they're quite fascinated that inside Canada, we had a, a kind of, if you will, a provincial aspect to this, where some provinces were also regulating uh, how fellow Canadians entered their provincial space. So lots to work through, but I think you know, again, being a, a federated country, a, a confederation helps us understand how we're going to have to deal with this with so many others, including our uh, border and the quarantine policies and how in the in the risk assessment, because risk is never zero. Mm -hmm. How do we do risk assessment? How do we do risk mitigation? And my hypothesis is it's going to require a really careful look at a number of variables, including what country you're traveling from or even what province in our case vaccinations, COVID rates, and variants, travelers are going to have to really pay attention to information, and we're going to have to do a good job communicating. Mm -hmm. It is fundamentally affecting, um, I would argue, also the concept of freedom of movement. And yeah. I think that's a very important component of the European Union as a, an economic market, mm -hmm. like as a body, but it, it also has affected Canada, as you pointed out, Eilish, because we've had, I won't say border closures, but um, restrictions on mm -hmm. internal travel. And I think that uh, for the first time in um, immemorial, I think, um, but it, the concept of freedom of movement is a very important one for the European Union. And, uh, and it was also one uh, and remains one a question, I think. So I'm using the vaccine certificate a bit as a proxy for the discussion of the movement of people between the European Union and the UK, um, and also between the European Union and the UK and Canada. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, you, this is another one of those never ending conversations because it is so evolutionary and revolution, revolutionary at the same time. Um, for me, and since we're talking to our colleagues, public servants, this is a great public policy question. Really fascinating because of all of the different aspects involved. So you will remember that in the beginning, the discussions around vaccine certification were really around domestic issues. Do I need it to, in the UK here was, do I need it to go into a pub? Do I need it to go to a concert? And lots of consternation around, wait a minute, my freedom of movement within my own country, already you're saying that's going to be limited and maybe I have a reason I don't have the vaccine. There's a whole other subset of what is fully vaccinated. If you get one AstraZeneca and one Moderna, are you fully vaccinated? So, you know, we could have a committee debating that for some time. Um, here in the United Kingdom, the data issues are less dreadful than they are in Canada because the national health system captures all the data and they have an existing app that can be converted so that you can actually use that to show a QR code or whatever it might be. Not forgetting, of course, there is still a significant number of people who does not carry a mobile phone and is not capable of pulling up a, a widget when necessary. In Canada, and again, a, a long standing issue around data, FedProv territorial, who holds the data, who is willing to share it, 
who's willing to share it in a timely manner. I mean, we've tried for I don't know how many years to come up with a piece of federal identification. This is virtually impossible. There was a whole separate discussion around the actual passport that has a little chip in it. There were a whole lot of people saying, well, we could just wave it past some health database and the information would fly into the chip and then, but no, no, that is also not an option. So IRCC, CBSA, Transport Canada, probably some of you watching right now, closely involved in, in developing a thing. And I presume it's gonna to have to be more than one A, eh? something in hard copy. So like I said, really interesting from an ideological perspective, policy perspective, but I think what everybody agrees with, and we certainly from many, many months ago, there has to be something. There has to be a way of proving that you have had both of your vaccinations, whatever they are, so that yes, you can get on that cruise or on that aircraft. The other angle there is what are the airlines checking? Let's say the Indians come up with one version and the Brits another, and uh, you can just see how complicated that would all become. Um, you know, ironically, it would lead to greater freedom of movement. If we do have a something or other that is recognized by everybody, you'd think ICAO should be involved, right? So that it would be globally acceptable as well as the WHO. Here's where we need reinforced WHO authorities or, or w, uh, ICAO authorities as well. So the way forward becomes clearer for everybody. Um, and, and Canada can't wait. This is another thing. There's been, well, you know, we'll get around to it. No, no, the EU is there, right? Dr. Campbell, if she wanted to tomorrow, she could go out and get, well, I don't know if you're fully vaccinated, go out and get the, the green certificate. And right now, Brits are traveling, showing uh, details of their vaccinations to Portugal and back and Iceland and back. So it's now, the time is now. It's a fascinating development of the pandemic. Uh, where this idea of, cert of certifying your health um, is, is becoming a new travel document, I won't use the word passport, but a means of, of accessing um, another country, another place, another province, perhaps even within Canada. I'm going to switch gears uh, again. <laughs> um, you're, you both have summits coming up. Uh, the Prime Minister is coming to, uh, I was going to say to London, but it's Cornwall, um, and to Brussels, both for um, the NATO summit, but also for the, uh, the EU-Canada uh, uh, relationship summit. Um, so all public servants are always keen on this. How and on what are you briefing the prime minister? What are the top five issues? How's that? <laughs> Well, here, I'll go first, just because in chronological order, the G7 summit is first. So I guess in, in good public service format, I should tell you, we're not briefing the prime minister anything. This is a multilateral visit, right? It's not actually under the control of this bilateral mission here in the United Kingdom. If it were a Commonwealth meeting, yeah, because we are accredited to the Commonwealth. So we'll be talking to him about his bilateral meeting with Boris Johnson. But more broadly, for the G7, it's a series of ministerials, right? So there have been actually, I think, seven ministerial meetings in the lead up to this summit, each of them highly successful. Uh, a couple of them in person and the rest virtual. Interestingly chosen in part because of the pandemic, but also by virtue of what they're discussing. In some cases, you need to be here in person. Uh, Foreign Minister Marc Galneau was here in person. Most of what they talked about, you will not read about in the press. And therefore, it's actually hard to justify that, well, they talked about X, and that's why they had to be there in person. It's kind of this weird problem that we get ourselves into. Um, the Prime Minister has also spoken to Prime Minister Johnson several times in the lead up to this summit. Prime Minister Johnson has done what I would expect any good leader to do. He's made calls to all the G7 leaders. He wants to make sure that his summit is well set up for success. It needs to be a success from a domestic political perspective, as well as Prime Minister Johnson's own personal motivation and, and frankly, for the world. Is it an interesting pandemic phenomenon here? I'll just mention because it's not, not normal. Um, in the actual in-person meetings in the lead up to this summit, people have been so happy 
to be in the same room with other actual humans, the atmosphere has been overwhelmingly positive, effusive even. And so what would normally be maybe thorny discussions on the negotiations of a final communique, oh, you want that word? Sure. Or how about this other word? How about this sentence instead? You know, flower throwing, air kissing, much happiness. So it's actually a really great wave to ride. And in fact, maybe it's looking like the very high ambitions of the United Kingdom will all be met. And I would largely contribute that to people just being delighted to have actual human interaction, which I would say is another reason that it is very important that we have in-person diplomacy. All kinds of discussions around that, and that's maybe a separate conversation, but really the way forward. I can go through the G7 priorities if you like, but you guys can read them online. What I think is really neat is this atmosphere thing and, and how much is achieved in person that is not achievable by MS teams. Interesting. Ailish. Yes, Stephanie, I, I really appreciate that atmosphere point. Um, it sounds great to me because imagine I've arrived during the pandemic. I started my posting in November 2020. I haven't even met my our management team. Uh, as a whole in person, we've been doing everything on Teams. And there, there is this magical moment when you do meet someone for the first time with your masks outside in the park. And you're like, wow, you're, you're a real person. So I think your atmospherics point is really well taken. And, and let's make the most of it for Canada uh, at, at this time, because I think we have a strong relationship. Uh, let's just talk, you know, globally, credibility, stability, uh, a vision. Uh, of the future that I think has been really well served uh, by successive governments in Canada across a long period of time. Uh, there's a reason we're known, uh, if you will, as the, the closest uh, thing to a, to a member state who's not a member state of the European Union because of those values and, and interests and ways of doing things that I talked about. And of course, as well, I think our unique um, understanding of both uh, the, the multiculturalism, but also the, the here now in the core uh, of the European Union this started as a Franco-German project and now has uh, advanced to both the Nordics that we understand, uh, Eastern Europe, who we know from our work in NATO. And so when we brief our, our prime minister, I think it's gonna be really important. First and foremost, it's all about pandemic recovery. It's about our recovery in harmony with others, which includes you know, stable supply chains. It includes vaccines and ongoing research and development. Let's not forget, of course, on therapeutics because COVID is gonna be with us and diagnostics. Um, so the pandemic recovery, but also all the things that we talked about today with regards to equity and inclusion. I think uh, as soon as we're out of the health crisis, we're into uh, a really deep social and economic crisis and understanding and sharing lessons and best practices, real true ones. For example, the Germans taught us in the last global financial crisis um, a lot about both active labor market uh, training, career retraining for people um, who are outside of uh, formal university years. Canada still has a lot of work to do on increasing training uh, of people after their traditional college and high school years. And so that active labor market retraining piece and also job sharing, which was a, a key feature. Um, we saw some uh, good wage stabilization and subsidies as part of our pandemic response, the Canada Emergency Business Account for Small Business. So there's all kinds of lessons on the pandemic recovery. And then obviously the, the other big issue is pandemic recovery globally. So how are we increasing the supply of vaccines and production globally? How are we focused, for example, um, on vaccine diplomacy for Africa, for, for the Caribbean and Latin South America, which is really Canada's neighborhood? How are we helping so many others that need access to the, this vaccine? That has to, though, those will absolutely be the top uh, two issues. And then because I, I think uh, both of you have, have done a great job highlighting it, uh, the biodiversity, climate change, and also just ongoing environmental regulation, sustainability, and bringing in all aspects uh, of society into uh, the common project that we have to do in order to safeguard uh, this planet, a nature positive solution. I remind people here uh, in Europe that when Canada takes its 30% uh, protected spaces by 2030 and beyond that, it's, a, it's an area equivalent to the five largest EU member states plus three others. So Canada is in, in essence, along with the Amazon, the, the Congo Basin and, and Central um, Europe's uh, peat bog 
and the carbon sinks there. Those, these are the four lungs of the planet. So the environment will absolutely be uh, front and, and foremost in those discussions with the prime minister also because Canada uh, is, is seen as a leader, but also has to show how energy intensive economies can make this transition. So lots of good conversations with provincial colleagues to come uh, as well, particularly in Alberta, Saskatchewan and British Columbia, as we make that green transition that, that uh, Stephanie highlighted. Um, I'm going to wrap up now because it's been a little bit of time we've a conversation that has touched on almost all the subjects we wanted to cover. Uh, and I think for, for those of you who are um, uh, watching and listening, uh, you've got a complete overview of all the public policy challenges uh, that um, Canadian public servants uh, will uh, face or are facing. Uh, I, we, we share values with the uh, European Union and the UK. We have good transatlantic partnerships. We have good trade relationships. We have good and similar governance mechanisms, or, uh, but we can uh, share our, act, our lessons, our public policy and our programs. Uh, we have made some major strides in many areas that we can share with others and um, we can learn from the others as well. But I think on the value system, on the governance, um, on uh, our uh, approach to climate, uh, I think that we have and our approaches to trade, a rules-based international order, uh, we have lots of commonalities that we can continue to pursue. And I want to thank you both. Sincere remerciement, Dr. Campbell, Ms. Beck, Stephanie Eilish. Thank you both for this um, uh, fascinating coverage of a very wide range of issues. So I wish you all well in your summits that are coming up. And uh, un grand merci. Au revoir. Merci. Bye-bye. Merci. Au revoir.